Good day, everyone. My name is Brian Proppitt, welcoming you to another edition of Community Central, where we highlight different communities and projects that are going on in the Red Hat ecosystem. Before I introduce today's guests, I'd like to remind you of some general housekeeping notes. We will be doing questions and answers at the end of the presentation today. And if you could put your questions in the Q&A tool here in the BlueJeans Primetime interface, that would be great. Vote on the ones that you want to hear about the most, and, and the ones that are most liked, we'll ask those in order uh, of that. So um, with all that out of the way, I'm very pleased to introduce Dabarshi Ray, who is an engineer with the Red Hat desktop team and a key developer on the Toolbox project, if I'm pronouncing Toolbox right. So uh, Dabarshi, uh, welcome, and thanks for coming today. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to my talk. So, can you see my slides okay? We can indeed, so take it away. Okay. So, my name is Debarshi. You can call me Rishi, and I will be talking about Toolbox today. Uh, as you can see, I have an email address, a blog, and I'm on, I'm on several chat networks like Matrix, IRC, and so on. Uh, so I am Rishi. I often go by that nickname on the internet. I work for the Red Hat desktop team. Uh, I've been contributing to Fedora for the past 15 years. I'm uh, particularly focused on Fedora Silverblue workstation. And I'm also a longtime contributor to GNOME. And I've worked on almost all parts of it, I guess. And these days I also work on Flatpak. So um, the title of the talk is uh, developing on and debugging emerging OSs. Uh, so what's an emerging operating system? So for our talk today, uh, an emerging operating system is, is a Linux OS, which is uh, delivered as an OS3 image. Uh, OS3 is this uh, project. Um, you, in very simple terms, you can think of it as a Git for operating system images or trees. And uh, it, it's got a very extensive set of documentation, which you can all look up. There's the link down there. And so uh, the whole idea behind these emerging OSs, like these OS tree based operating systems, is that uh, um, they promise the idea of robust upgrades. So the idea is that, uh, like, um, if you're doing an upgrade and your laptop dies because the battery died or somebody yanked out the power cable, uh, or the network died, then uh, you shouldn't end up with a bricked system, which is something that's a possibility on uh, our current uh, conventional package-based Linux systems like Fedora Workstation, RHEL, Arch Linux, so on. And then you have like uh, easy to roll, easy to roll back fault, easy, easy to roll back faulty upgrades. What it means is that like sometimes, once in a while, it does happen that you did an upgrade and suddenly your uh, headphones don't work or the laptop doesn't suspend or I don't know, like uh, your something's glitchy about your uh, graphics or something. And uh, it tends to be very difficult to like, like get rid of this faulty update and go back to what you used to have. I mean, as engineers, we often struggle to nail down what exactly happened. And even if we can, we can somehow like work around it or fix it. but this is pretty much impossible for um, someone who is not technical. And um, this is something that has been traditionally pretty messy to do with package-based systems. Whereas uh, on these uh, new generation Linux operating systems, this is just uh, this is just something that you can just uh, select from the boot menu. So it's a pretty foolproof, I would say. And then, uh, then the final uh, thing, but not the least, is that uh, these kind of operating systems are easy to test, um, which is really important because if you can't test what you're delivering, then the chances are that uh, it will have problems. So what does it really mean? Um, what it means is that uh, if you think about how like uh, Linux operating systems have been delivered to users over the years, um, it's basically uh, when the user updates or installs something, uh, he or she gets uh, um, 
some content from a vast network of mirrors scattered around the world. And on the other end, there is the there are the people working on developing that OS who are constantly building and uploading content to this mirror network. So there is this constant churn and nobody is really sure if all the mirrors are synced right at the same with the same kind of content. Like you could have a mirror in Spain that is slightly outdated than the mirror in the US or, or which can be again slightly outdated compared to the mirror in Czech Republic or, or and so on and so forth. So it's very difficult for someone to say that this is the state of uh, let's say Fedora today. Like uh, like if, if if you if you went and said I, I have tested uh, Fedora today, nobody really knows what you tested because you might have tested the package set uh, that's there on your mirror today, like geographically, whatever is your mirror. But that might not be the same for another person, and and whatever is on your mirror might be changing in a in an hour or so. So, since OS3 is Git for operating systems, one of those things that we are all used to with Git is that every commit has a hash. So on these OS3 based systems, every upgrade has a hash. So if you so you can very clearly say that you tested this particular hash, and that would be the same for everybody. So, so there is at least some some baseline with which you can communicate with people that I tested this. Does it work on this build? If it doesn't, could you please roll back or upgrade to that specific build that I tested? So that's the third point. Uh, so um, that was basically the background idea behind why these things even exist. So uh, going further, uh, we see that uh, on these kind of OS3 based operating systems, uh, the, the OS tends to be separate from the applications. So what it means is that uh, the core OS is delivered as, a, as, a, as an OS3 image. And by core OS, I mean uh, things like the kernel, like your base runtime like glibc or dbus or um, like your um, login manager like like gdm or or gnome shell like like the the very basic thing that you have that really needs to boot for the computer to work and be usable so that's the os and that's delivered in the um, in your uh, in an in an os3 image and that's very that's very separate from your applications so your applications could be desktop uh, GUI applications like your browser or your media player and so on and it could also be like server applications so uh, whatever those applications are they are meant to be uh, delivered separately from the OS3 image in containers so flatpak containers for desktop client-side applications and OCI containers for for server and uh, cloud workloads so um, so there are some examples of uh, this new breed of OSs, like the oldest that I'm aware of, uh, um, which um, which was kind of like the like the test bed for OS3 when Colin Walters was uh, working on it, is uh, something called the uh, um, well, it has been known differently. Like it used to be called as GNOME Continuous. These days, it's called GNOME OS. Uh, but it's this, uh, whatever the name is, it's basically the idea is that uh, it's a nightly build of GNOME and everything that's uh, necessary beneath it. So, so it builds a fully functional operating system right from your Git commits, right from the commits uh, to the kernels, Git tree, to all the Git commits going in on gitlab.gnome.org and everything in between to, to the graphics drivers in Mesa and so on. And, and it, it gives you an OS3 image that you can install in a virtual machine and see what's the state of GNOME today, like as, as of like, like the state of the Git main or the Git master branches of the projects. So that like, uh, so that like people who are not programmers can kind of see, like designers can see what GNOME looks like tonight. And then uh, you have another, something else called Endless OS, which is uh, basically a GNOME and Debian derivative for emerging markets. It's also been around for a while. Pretty interesting. I would uh, ask, encourage you to check it out. And then, of course, uh, closer home, we have uh, 
uh, all the different Fedora editions. So there is Silver Blue, and then there's a Kino Art. Uh, they are the next generation Fedora workstation and uh, KDE pins. And then, of course, uh, um, very famously, we have CoreOS, which is basically a merger of uh, CoreOS Inc.'s uh, container Linux and uh, Project Atomic's Atomic host. And it's basically a very minimal OS3 based image, OS3 based operating system that's, uh, that's uh, primarily designed for running cloud and server workloads. So, so going on, um, going deeper, one thing you would notice in an emerging, like a OS3 based operating system is that it doesn't come with a package manager which is one of its uh, biggest uh, differences from a conventional package-based uh, OS. So it, you won't see things like DNF in it. And if you dig further, you would see that it comes with a read-only slash USR. And uh, taken together, if you think about it, uh, what it means is that the OS itself, that the OS3 image itself is a bit hard to modify. Um, I wouldn't say that it's impossible to modify. There are ways to get around it, um, but let's. It, but it's fair to say that uh, it's designed to be hard to modify, because uh, being hard to modify is what gets you some of those initial advantages of being easy to test and being uh, robust upgrades and easy to roll back. So that's part of the design, from the get-go. Uh, so uh, to, to have a very clear example, so if you have an um, Fedora 35 silver blue system, the screenshot. Uh, so the first line, you can see that it, uh, it, it shows the Fedora release, so you can be sure of what it is. And then you see that there is no DNF. Um, but then there is this thing called RPM OS3. And uh, like I said, it, um, it, it, it has some funny uh, output from it. But uh, the point to remember is that there is no DNF here. Uh, so if you don't have a package manager, how do you go about doing some of the things that uh, you usually do, right? Like, um, like just to remind you, like the talk is called developing and troubleshooting emerging OSs. So how would you set up a development environment on such an OS to get your work done? So how would you install compilers, debuggers, uh, you know, editors, uh, your SDKs, and so on? Something that we usually do using a package manager uh, on a conventional Linux OS. So one thing that someone might guess is using GNOME Builder as a flatback. The so GNOME Builder is this con what you, one might call a container native IDE. Container native because it's very aware of um, being inside a container, that the IDE is inside a container like a flatpak container, and then the fact that the programmer might be um, developing inside the container, as in like the programmer's libraries, tools, and um, header files and everything, they are inside a container, which could be different from the container where the ID itself is writing, uh, running. And then there could be a third container, which could be the end result of the application that you're building. So in that sense, uh, GNOME Builder is very like aware of these concepts. So that's one way you could uh, get your work done on such an OS. But, uh, but GNOME Builder is, uh, again, very specifically meant for uh, working on uh, graphical applications, like if you're programming a graphical application, like if you're writing a media player or, or a browser or things like that. But what about, um, what if you are doing something else, right? Like not everybody is writing uh, desktop applications. So what if you are uh, like a tool chain developer, like you're, you, you work on a compiler or something, or you, you're a GNOME shell developer, or you're a Pipefire developer, or you could be, I don't know, like uh, someone working on X or Wayland or Mesa or so on, right? What then? Or you could be doing web apps, why not, right? Um, um, so what about, what about other IDs? Um, so we do have Visual Studio as a flat pack, but but it will tend to look for your development tools inside the Flatpak container or inside the Flatpak runtime. So things like if you want to use uh, S-Trace or GDB or, or what have you, you know, like uh, 
and uh, it can get tricky to get it to get Visual Studio Code to transparently pick up these tools from somewhere else. And even if you do manage to do that, because there are plugins to somewhat get that done, even if you do manage to get it to get binaries from something that's not the flat background time, then uh, what does that other place look like? Because that other place cannot be your host OS, because uh, as we saw, it's kind of difficult to uh, install things into it. And, and of course, like um, a lot of us uh, are still using Emacs, Vim, and we, I mean, we spend a lot of time on the terminal, so there's no end to the number of uh, things that we need from the command line. So what then? And then, uh, so this was about developing on such an operating system. What about like if you have to troubleshoot the OS itself? Right, like what if you are a sysadmin, or what if you are just trying to figure out what's wrong with your desktop or laptop, like maybe uh, something is hogging the memory or the CPU is pegged or something. So for example, like one, there's this uh, venerable uh, SOS report tool, which uh, um, many real customers use to file support tickets. Like it's kind of uh, gives you a very detailed log of the operating system. And then there are, of course, things like Nmap, TCP dump, or, um, or let's say, S-Trace, right? Um, because none of these things are going to be part of the core operating system, especially if the core operating system is something like CoreOS, which is, is designed to be minimal. So they are not, such OSs are not going to come with these extra tools. So how do you, uh, how do you figure out why something is not working? So, for example, uh, taking another look at Fedora Silverblue, uh, uh, what really happens is that uh, is that there is this thing called RPM OS3, uh, which we saw a few slides ago. So, RPM OS3 is this kind of a thing that lets you install RPMs into your OS3 image. So, in some sense, it's a bit like DNF that you can add stuff to your OS image. Um, but the problem is you need to reboot generally. Generally speaking, there's, there are ways to get around it, but generally you would have to reboot, which can be annoying. Like let's say you're trying to build this new program or that you down, that you get cloned from the internet and you, you, you're working your way through the dependencies and whatnot, running, you know, mess on setup or uh, dot slash configure and you, and, uh, Having to reboot several times as you work through that can be really annoying. And uh, it's even more annoying if you are in the middle of a debugging session and then you realize that you're missing a debugging tool and you need to reboot to get that. It, it can be rage inducing. And then too much use of uh, RPM OS3 just negates the benefits of OS3 because as you add more and more packages to your OS3 image, you end up with a bespoken, like a unique OS build that uh, nobody ever has tested before. So if things break, um, it will become very difficult for you to have a conversation with someone that uh, about what is a tested build that's supposed to work. So where do we go from here? Because uh, <laughs> we are kind of stuck. Like uh, we have this uh, new breed of operating systems that pr make, a, that promise a glorious future, but they have. Uh, it seems that it's very difficult to develop on it and uh, debug them themselves. So uh, that's where Toolbox comes in. Um, so as you might have noticed, that it uh, it's Toolbox spelled without the final O, uh, because it's uh, trendy to drop the last vowel, uh, like uh, we did with Flatpak, or or sorry, not the last vowel, but the last um, character. Because with Flatpak we dropped the C, uh, because uh, it, it because otherwise it's uh, difficult to find like uh, domain names and it's, it becomes really hard to search for on the internet and so on. Prime real uh, prime internet real estate becomes a bit of a problem. Um, so yeah, so there's a website, um, and what Toolbox does is that, is that it makes it very trivial to get a mutable package-based environment on your OS3 based operating system. So suddenly you go from this kind of hard to modify environment that seems locked down to something that's very familiar, like 
where you can use a package uh, package manager where you can easily install DNF install random RPMs and so on. But yet it's uh, decoupled from your operating system. So even if you make a blunder inside the container, inside the toolbox, um, you are fine. Like your host operating system is uh, unaffected. And uh, you might have, uh, I know sometimes on the internet you might have noticed uh, uh, the old spellings and the old former names of Toolbox because it started off as Fedora Toolbox. Uh, I'll go through the history a bit later. Uh, so uh, back to our Fedora 35 Silver Blue system, uh, but this time with Toolbox. So the first line, um, uh, there's a Toolbox Enter command. Um, we start with the Toolbox Enter, and then you can notice the purple hexagon, which denotes that we are inside the, the toolbox, not uh, on the host. And then again, again you can verify that uh, we are inside the toolbox. We are still on a Fedora 35 machine, but this time we have DNF. And this time we can very easily install S-Trace, for example. Um, so, um, the toolbox is based on uh, containers. Uh, as I kind of gave away a few minutes ago, I, uh, a slip of tongue, uh, I mentioned containers. So it's based on containers and it's based on OCI containers. And it uses this uh, this tool called Podman, which is uh, truly amazing. Uh, you can check out podman.io. It's, a, it's, a, it's supposed to be a drop-in replacement for Docker, but it's uh, just uh, a lot cooler. Uh, so what Toolbox really offers is that it takes away the cognitive overhead of using containers because uh, because because while it's kind of easy to just uh, get some kind of container up and running, if you really have to spend your time inside the container because that's what you would be doing because you are trying we are trying to sidestep the 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 lockdown OS3 image by spending most of our time inside the toolbox to get back the the, the well-known uh, Linux CLI experience. But then things become a bit tricky because uh, because it's hard to figure out how to get the display server to work, or then if you have, if you need Kerberos for your work, it, 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 that's a bit tricky. And then what about your SSH agent? Because these are all little things that we have gotten used to working on our laptop. So if you are a developer who's pushing code to GitHub or some GitLab uh, installation somewhere, constantly having to like type in your SSH passphrase or if you are uh, even a Fedora developer because Fedora, um, to get work done in Fedora, you sometimes need Kerberos. It, these things are gonna get frustrating. And uh, if you want to run like, let's say a utility, graphical utility from the container um, if, and you don't have access to a display server, it gets annoying. Like let's say you're a GTK developer or a Qt, Qt developer and you want to uh, just uh, run your test programs to check out your library and so on. So, so the primary goal of Toolbox is to bring back the usual command line on uh, on these emerging uh, OS3 based OSs uh, in a way that it it's uh, the development experience is just the same as before and same for the for the troubleshooting experience. And as you can imagine it's uh, really crucial for the adoption of uh, OSs like Silver Blue Kinoart and CoreOS, because ultimately a huge chunk of uh, Linux uh, users are basically people either writing applications or developing applications or deploying applications or sysadmins uh, trying to debug their uh, deployments. Um, so, so you can use Toolbox uh, just as your normal user and then uh, you'll get a toolbox environment which is equivalent to your uh, usual environment on the host, the us usual command line environment on the host. Uh, but if you do need elevated privileges, like if you are uh, troubleshooting the network with nmap or TCB dump, then you can use toolbox with sudo and then you get uh, an environment that's uh, equivalent to the real root on the host, but still, uh, but still separate from the core operating system, so, yeah. Uh, so a bit of history, uh, so 
other than having a website, Toolbox is a Git repository. It's uh, on GitHub. It's part of the containers organization. It's also the same organization that uh, that hosts Podman. So these are pretty close, uh, closely related as projects. And uh, Toolbox started in 2018, it, pretty much two months after rootless Podman became a thing. So um, in the in early days, they were uh, developed very pretty much in lockstep, like, uh, um, and uh, it helped shake out bugs everywhere. And also like uh, Podman, it's written in Go, like most, like many things in this uh, OCI landscape. And uh, and a bit more of history. So um, Toolbox was originally inspired by uh, by a similarly named tool that was hosted on the core OS uh, GitHub. Uh, although um, the code bases are completely different because uh, back when we started in 2018, uh, um, the core OS uh, Toolbox thing was using uh, things like RKT and SystemD and Spawn. Which um, well, Arcady doesn't quite uh, um, exist as a project today, and uh, the problem was that it required uh, sudo to do everything. Whereas um, we wanted, um, we wanted, we we didn't want the user to always have to type sudo toolbox because uh, you know, like you don't need sudo access to get your day-to-day -day terminal, right? I mean, most of our development work is just done without ever using sudo. So suddenly, if people need to have root access to write their code every morning, then uh, it's not quite the same user experience. And also, uh, if you have, if somebody ever wants to have their toolbox environment as their default shell, which you which you pretty much can do, like you just configure your terminal to spawn a toolbox shell as by default, then uh, the root requirement becomes a hassle, right? And and yeah, I mean, we have seen some adoption over the years and months. So a, a quick look at uh, what works inside a toolbox environment today. So you have access to Wayland and the X uh, display servers. So if you have a graphical application that uses uh, that's a Wayland or X client, it should work. Uh, the SSH agent works, as I mentioned before. So, and also, if you are a, a programmer who works on uh, plumbing, like debug services and stuff, uh, should work. And then, uh, basic things like Awahi, DNS, uh, VPN, they all work. Um, some of them are a bit tricky to get right, but they all work. Um, Ping also is surprisingly tricky to uh, get it to work inside. Uh, because of the whole raw sockets thing. Um, then uh, Nmap works, uh, and you get and the you get the whole suite of uh, Nmap uh, features, like uh, even things that require uh, root access, like OS detection and scanning with TCP, like this half TCP uh, scans and so on. TCP dump works. Um, and then uh, other nice things like, for example, uh, the time zones inside your toolbox environment stays in sync with the time zone in your on your uh, laptop or on your host operating system. So if you are traveling and you switch your time zone, it will transparently work to avoid surprises, basically. And then, of course, uh, USB removable devices like pen drives, USB sticks, and all that, they work. Um, Kerberos works. Um, Smart cards work. Um, then, uh, if you want, you can uh, if you install the locate command, which is like a cache for searching, uh, like an indexed search kind of thing, a rudimentary index search kind of thing. It works. And also, the toolbox environments have the same U limits as uh, as your host, which uh, is a bit important sometimes. Like for example, uh, if you are running the GStreamer test suite and you don't have the exact U limits as the host, and uh, the suite can fail in, in weird ways. Um, Libword works, including the system instance, and then uh, uh, also this thing called Minikube, which is um, which is uh, like a single node um, OpenShift a Kubernetes cluster, basically, um, and it also works. 
Um, so what doesn't work yet, um, yet is very important because uh, they will soon get done, soon. So um, the NVIDIA proprietary driver doesn't currently work, but uh, you can have uh, OpenGL and Vulkan uh, inside the containers if, if you're using the free drivers like uh, Mesa DRI drivers and Mesa Vulkan drivers. So if you have a AMD card or an Intel card, you should have full support. For NVIDIA, you still you, you'll have full support for Nuvo, but uh, the, it needs some packaging work and some other uh, hacks here and there to get the NVIDIA proprietary driver to work. Um, the, then the, another thing that um, we already have uh, pull requests for it is to get a full Wayland session working with LoginD. This is not about running a Wayland application inside the toolbox, but if you are like a graphics developer or if you are like a GNOME shell developer and you want to run your uh, the, the the build of GNOME shell that you are working on and you, you want to run a full session, desktop session from your toolbox environment. So this is about that. So we have uh, PRs for it. So hopefully this will work soon. Um, then we have some rough edges with locales, um, which need some polish. And of course, uh, host certificates, like uh, if you have a corporate CS certificate um, that you need to install for internal uh, websites, um, ideally we would like those certificates to get uh, picked up from the host, but it doesn't work today. You need to set it up, set them up separately inside the toolbox, which can be, which would be nice to fix. And uh, moving on, um, right now we do have like uh, the officially supported toolbox environments. We have like Fedora and RHEL containers. So you can, uh, it's very easy to set up a Fedora toolbox or a RHEL toolbox and um, it's just toolbox create. And there's a distro option. So you mention it and it uh, will switch whichever distro you want. Uh, we have been working for a while to get uh, official support for Arch and Ubuntu, so to have officially supported images and to make it as easy to work with them as Fedora and RHEL. Uh, but I've heard, but uh, there are already like working images uh, on the internet that you can always pull in and create containers with. I hear that the I mean they are really popular, like so people are already using it every day. They're just not like uh, nicely plugged in as the other two. Um, so uh, this was about, uh, so this was like about uh, Toolbox uh, solving its primary target of, uh, primary goal of helping with the adoption of OS2 based emerging OSs. But what about like conventional operating systems, um, package based OSs that we are so familiar with? Um, is Toolbox even relevant there? So it turns out that it works just fine on package-based OSs. So like Arch Linux, Fedora Workstation, uh, Toolbox is actually now in RHEL since 8.5, and uh, what have you. Like, I mean, these three, I just picked them up to give an idea of it. It, it. it will work just fine on any uh, conventional OS. So what's the value of having Toolbox in the conventional OS? So it turns out that uh, the kind of workflows that have been, let's say, unlocked or forced upon us by these OS3 based uh, OSs, there is a certain value in using those same workflows on a conventional OS because, uh, because even though on a conventional federal workstation, you can very easily DNF install whatever you want, like GCC, S trace, uh, Ruby, Python, whatever. Um, like uh, muddying up your host OS with lots of packages, it's, um, it's always is a bit of a problem because if uh, you want to, if if some, the, because the more packages you put in, the more chances are higher the chances that something would go wrong. Maybe because the chances of something going wrong because of the network going down or some packaging bug or whatever, what have you. It's, and 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 if you're doing something experimental, it's kind of not that easy to just like throw away your experiment and getting back to the pristine OS state because you can always DNF remove, but you're never really sure if it is uh, removing something that was supposed to be there. 
or those RPM scriptlets and whatnot messing up some other config somewhere. And then, uh, and then, uh, if, uh, so that's one advantage that you can do your experiments on a conventional OS in a separate toolbox. Then you can have easy access to different uh, tool chain and library versions. Let's say you're a developer and you get a bug report that uh, your code doesn't compile on Ubuntu and you are you use Arch or you use Fedora and uh, so if you can just set up a Ubuntu environment quickly and you have access to the tool chain and uh, you can very easily check it out. And hence it reduces the need for a virtual machine, although it doesn't fully replace virtual machines, but uh, for various use cases. Um, if you are, um, as long as you don't need a separate kernel or, or a, or a full blown OS on its own, you're, you're fine with the toolbox container. So, so there is some nice, uh, like a uh, value add for users on uh, conventional package based systems as well. And, um, that's it. Um, um, this is a website you can, uh, I encourage you to go there. It, um, it, it has links to everything relevant that you might want to know about the project, documentation, code, so on. Um, and yeah, I guess we have some time for questions. We do. Um, so we have a number of questions, so I'm gonna jump right in. Surrender asks, what is the main reason to not have a package manager in these operating systems? Uh -huh. uh, good question. So, so the idea is that um, the moment you, you have a package manager, so first of all, like you can think of RPM OS3 as sort of like a package manager because it, it, because it gives you this kind of a bridge between RPM packages and an OS3 image. Because you cannot have like a simple DNF because the DNF doesn't know how to work with OS3. Um, but the problem, but the reason they are discouraged is that the more you use a package manager or something like RPM OS3 to install content on your, on your OS, the more you diverge from what was uh, tested by the people producing the OS. And so you, you are more and more in unknown territory. Although there are ways to like completely unlock the OS3 image and uh, you can put in whatever you want in your slash USR, it, it's no longer uh, read only then if you like, there are ways to unlock it. But then if you reboot the system, those changes go away because that's an easy way to reset or to, to recover from mistakes. Um, so that's, uh, I don't know if that answered your question. It's mostly to have like a well-known tested core because, and to discourage people from modifying it too much because then it kind of becomes hard to test. But if you really want, then you can. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that was a solid answer. So Joshua asked, will two toolbox be able to support adding volume mounts. Um, we use mount slash Red Hat a lot and would like to replace some shared hosts with containerized environments in toolbox. Right, um, so um, I think you are asking if you can add extra bind mounts into the toolbox environment, right? The container environment, right? Is that the question? How to add extra locations inside it? Yeah, it's not clear. I just read the question off of mm. that, but that sounds like what's being asked. Yes. Okay, okay. So one thing you would notice is that uh, Toolbox bind mounts the entire slash from the host into a special location inside the container. Like it doesn't put the whole slash into the container's uh, slash, but it puts the slash from the host into slash run host inside the container. So that's one way you can do your own bind mounts yourself, like mount dash dash r bind, blah, 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 because the container has its own uh, mount namespace. So that should totally work. In fact, that's how we set up many of the bind mounts inside the toolbox. But what's lacking right now is that we don't have a persistent way for the 
user to specify that these are the extra mounts that I always want when the container starts up. It's something that we would like to address. We recently introduced a, uh, a persistent configuration file for certain parameters, but it's pretty basic at the moment. Uh, yeah, but this is a very common uh, ask and we would add something, yeah. Okay. Um, Andrew asks, we are excited about using Toolbox to give our engineers access to a common shared container-based environment. Is there a team within Red Hat that they can engage with to work through issues that are uncovered, like around networking, SE Linux, Kerberos, mounts, et cetera, as they migrate more use cases? Yeah, sure. Like, you, you can always... Uh... Talk to me like I'm part of the display systems or the desktop team. Um, yeah, and yeah. hopefully uh, we will be able to route the problems to the, I mean, it might not always be a toolbox problem, but uh, we will figure that out, yeah. Yeah, and, and kind of as a follow-up for me, um, I, I assume that's also the case, like if they go to container toolbox.org, they can work with the upstream community as well, right? Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So Ben asks, are there any plans to allow creation of toolbox containers uh, that use isolated mounts, like not the user's home? It sounds like that's a repeat of the earlier question, though. Uh, I guess the question is about a toolbox that's not the user's home, right? That doesn't have the user's home. Right. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, so for context, like um, right now, toolbox containers they have the user's home shared with the host. That's um, that makes it trivial to sh like share your data from the host to the container. So it's a it, this is a common question because um, uh, some some developers are worried about the fact that the the, the tool chains or the the, the 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 SDKs or the packages they might be using for their development. Somewhere in the dependency chain, they don't have like trusted code. So let's say you do some NPM, you try to get something, some NPM Node.js packages, and somewhere in there is something that does an RM minus RF and or uploads your SSH keys or whatnot or whatever, what have you. Uh, so, so yeah, so currently we don't have a, a, like a clean, nice answer or solution for this. Uh, various people have come up with interesting hacks. Like one is that they override the home environment variable before running toolbox. So they run like a, a home is equal to slash TMP secure location and then toolbox create. And then toolbox thinks that your home is a slash TMP secure location, not slash home you. Um, so yeah, like uh, your mileage may vary a bit from time to time, but yeah, with, because we have sort of sidestepped this uh, security aspect of it because, because this is something that's already a problem and has been a problem for years on Federal Workstation, Debian, wherever. Like, so it's not really a regression in that sense because our primary goal is to get people um, back to the status quo that they had with legacy or conventional OSs so that they can still use the benefits of OS3 and, but not not have a hurdle in adoption in that sense. Okay, we yeah. have time. One more question, and that will be from Adam. Um, does Libvirt work fully within a toolbox or does it require additional packages installed on the host? Hmm. Well, um, my memory is a bit f fuzzy, but um, I don't think you need extra packages on the host as long as you do have libvirt running there. Um, and if you do run into, so if you have if you're running rootless toolbox, then you should be able to use the user's instance of libvirt, no problems. And I think you should be able to, connect to the system's installation of libvirt and to some extent. But if you do run into permission issues, then uh, if you go into sudo toolbox and you have uh, everything, you should have everything 
because that's that's the same as root on the on the OS so on the host OS. So. Okay. That sounds great. All right. I know we didn't get to everybody's questions, and sorry about that, because we're running uh, on the edge of our time limit. Um, we will pass your questions on to Rishi, um, and he can, you know, address them offline to you um, and get those questions answered later. Mm -hmm. um, until then, I definitely appreciate everybody uh, attending today's Community Central. And that, and certainly thank you, Rishi, for doing such an excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. All right, great. So uh, with that, we'll wrap up another edition of Community Central. Stay tuned. We have more episodes coming up this summer. Um, we're talking about exciting new projects going on in the open source world. Until next time, be safe, be well, and have an excellent day.